Welcome everyone, thanks for coming. I know this is a difficult time of year to get people to come to events uh, because everyone wants to be out in the sun or on vacation, lucky them. Um, but this is an absolutely fabulous panel and I've been waiting in anticipation for it so I'm sure that you're going to enjoy it. Um, tonight we've got Shepard Mullen as usual sponsoring us and Bill's just going to have a few words. Just real brief. So welcome everybody here. Thanks a whole lot for coming. It's a great to have you here. Um, I always enjoy these discussions. You guys have a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. So uh, I'm a patent uh, attorney here at uh, Shepherd Mall. So thank you very much. Have a great time. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Bill's been very supportive and has come as an attendee many times. Um, and also tonight we've got A-Chain sponsoring and Dave is going to say a few words and we're going to have a video, correct? Mm -hmm. Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Dave. I'm with A-Chain. Um, we are a open source blockchain platform based in Beijing. And we uh, currently have uh, over 75 dApps running on our platform and over 125 different smart contracts. Um, I would like to play a short video kind of introducing what A-Chain does. Uh, if you guys um, don't mind, I don't want to waste too much of your time. Thank you. Does your project need a cryptocurrency or token? Do existing platforms not conform to your specific requirements? Would you rather not compete with other applications for computer and network resources? But does the technology required intimidate you? A-Chain makes creating a dedicated blockchain easy. We're empowering startups, established businesses, entrepreneurs, and developers. A-Chain streamlines the process of creating and issuing tokens, smart contracts, apps, and decentralized systems. Access every tool of our rock-solid infrastructure capable of supporting variable traffic. Our unique sandbox development tool can verify smart contracts and support simulations. We'll test your systems, discover loopholes, and fix bugs to ensure your applications offer the best possible consumer experience. Enjoy all the benefits of our state-of-the-art blockchain technology, including speeds of 1,000 transactions per second, result delegated proof of stake consensus for end-to-end -end performance improvement and scalability, blockchain as a service functionality with unmatched reliability. We've built a secure, stable, customizable global blockchain network for information exchange and value transactions to facilitate your every need. Are you in a startup or established business thinking about how blockchain services can benefit you? Send us your proposal and we'll be in touch. Already an investor? We invite you to join A-Chain's new loyalty program. Register to learn how you can benefit from a boundless blockchain reality with A-Chain. Thanks so much and thanks to A-Chain. <laughs> Hope to see them here more often. Um, so now we're going to have the panel and we've got a brilliant moderator tonight. John Boydman, he's actually moderated for us in the past and um, I know he's brilliant with the people. So I'm going to pass that over to you and you can get the panelists to introduce themselves. Thank you. Okay, sounds great. Um, yeah, my name is John Boydman. I'm a local journalist based out of San Francisco. I write for Inc. Entrepreneur and Business Insider. So I'm happy to be here again with the, the panel for these excellent evenings. All right, so yeah, we'll take the first five minutes and uh, just introduce you guys. Um, David, why don't you head Go ahead and uh, talk for a minute or so, tell us your background, etc. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm David uh, Kravitz. Uh, currently, I'm with a company uh, based in the United Arab Emirates uh, called Dark Matter. It's a cross the board cybersecurity company. And I lead the, the crypto systems team. Uh, we're developing uh, an SDK. Uh, it's it's focused on uh, sort of a, from a smart city angle. So, uh, although it can be hybrid with, with permissionless blockchains like cryptocurrencies, uh, also dealing with the, the permissioned aspects of, of uh, IoT. Uh, my formerly, I was with IBM Research, where I did the initial work on the so-called membership services, the identity management of uh, hyperlink traffic. I'm Dave Usby. I'm the security maven at Hyperledger. It's part of the Linux Foundation. Um, every day, I just try to make good on the promise of open source software. Um, 
where you know, more eyeballs means more secure and more stable software. So that's what I get to do. Uh, my name is Anshi, and uh, I uh, am a photographer at uh, Intercast Technologies. Uh, it's a company uh, in Sunnyvale. Uh, it started as a, a digital rights management back in the day, uh, pioneered in it, and right now um, it's working on various uh, data security products and working on uh, the crypto aspects of all these products. And my background is theoretical property. Hi everyone, my name is Neil Ryder. I run the crypto practice for Identifying Global, which is a KYC AML risk and regulation uh, software service helping companies who are doing ICO or crypto exchanges. All right, awesome. Uh, so the way it's going to work is uh, we're going to talk for I'll say the, the first think for another forty minutes or so until about seven forty-five, and then we'll give the audience a chance to ask questions for about fifteen minutes, uh, all the way up until eight o'clock, and then uh, there'll be more networking and. And then I think has some, some startups doing some stuff. So we'll see. Uh, that's going to happen at 8. So yeah, we're just going to go with some different questions. So I wanted to start off with kind of a basic one. Um, ahead of time, we were, we were talking. and it, So with holding your own private keys versus an exchange, what are some of the different con uh, pros and cons of each? So um, basically, what are some of the things that people should keep in mind about crypto security? And the different options that they have include like private keys versus an exchange. So maybe just... For, for those of us, describe some of that. Uh, for, for those of us who don't quite know it, you know, the difference between those and what are some of the pros and cons of each. Um, who would like to start? Better stream? <laughs> um, so there are uh, multiple ways of storing your private keys, right? So uh, let me back, back off for a second. And, um, mention a point that uh, in cryptocurrencies, if you lose your private key, you lose all your money. So it all comes down to how you store and store your private key. Um, and there are multiple ways of uh, storing your uh, private keys. Uh, one is that you will let a third party uh, to uh, store your private key, uh, like an uh, exchange. And uh, uh, the pros and cons are that uh, you know it, it makes uh, your life easier if you use a third uh, party um, system. However, um, it makes it less decentralized now, right? Uh, in a centralized system, you wouldn't have a, a centralized database containing all your private keys, but now uh, there is one. Um, so if somebody hacks it, right? So that that's the pros and, uh, pro pros and cons of it. And uh, the other ways are that you can have these uh, software wallets and uh, hardware wallets, the code uh, hard wallets, right? So uh, in software wallets, you can have the, you can store these private keys in your uh, in, on your desktop or on your phones, and uh, for um, hardware wallets, you have these uh, uh, wallets that are offline. And uh, the good part about that is that you won't be uh, you, you may not have to think about situations where um, you know there there is a um, there's an attacker hacking into um, your phone or, or desktop and trying to steal your private keys. Um, so these are different ways, and uh, some of the examples for, for exchanges are Coinbase and um, software wallets. Um, and there's a service in um, uh, hardware wallet, there is Trezor, there are plenty of them. So um, the idea is to, um, I think the idea is to really understand the pros and cons of each of them. And, uh, and, and I, uh, I like to think about it as, uh, just the way I would think about uh, the uh, fiat currency, right? Um, so uh, you would want to keep some fluid cash uh, to do daily transactions, and uh, the remaining big amount in a more secure but not so usable. Unfortunately, not so usable, but in a more secure way, like a hardware wallet. Uh, do yeah. Does anyone else want to add anything to that as far as like mixing it like that? Um, yeah, I mean that's a good way of looking at it. I, the only thing I have to add is um, what's important to note is we're changing the security model of the world. So forever we've all logged in with a username and password and talked to a central server whenever we wanted to do anything like upload a photo or something. A message would go to a server. The server would go, oh, I'm talking to Dave. Dave wants to upload a photo. Okay, Dave can upload a photo. Now what we're talking about, it's, it's a security model that was first proposed by a guy named David Chong, another Dave, <laughs> back in the 80s. Um, it's called the capabilities model, where possession of a cryptographic key is all you need. 
It's more like the key to your house than it is like knowing the password that opens the door, right? Like you have a key that, that if I give it to David here, he can get into my house and I can't kind of thing. Um, but the, I guess the only thing I really add to this is that this presents a huge challenge when it comes to human computer interface. This is really not a cryptographer's challenge, I don't think. And it's not a security systems uh, challenge. I think this is more of like, what we really need is a Steve Jobs moment. I think what we have now with wallets and hardware wallets is like the old clickety, you know, mobile phones, you know, smartphones. And then one day Steve Jobs comes out and goes, no, 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 just use your finger. And everybody went, oh my gosh, that's, of course. Why didn't we think of that before? So we need something like that. I don't know what it is. But when we get there, that's when this kind of problem will start to go away. David's turn. <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, I guess as a cryptographer, I just add a couple points. Uh, one is there, there's a trade-off here between when you move the cryptographic key management to the edge of the network this way. So there, one, one trade-off is the convenience factor. So you can use so-called multi-signatures, which means that for certain high value certain types of transactions, are uh, the way you, if you set it up so that it's not enough just to have the signatures from your private key, but also from, from an online, while and or something to keep in a safe deposit box. And so you could do a two out of three methodology. Uh, one place this, this is used is if you have a list, a white list of merchants that you use, and then it shows up, you're, you're transacting with a different merchant, then your online wallet might say, until you authenticate yourself and, and add that merchant, they're not they're gonna refuse to, to sign, so then you'd have to like give yourself this your uh, safe deposit box key. So which which of course can be inconvenient. And the other thing I'd like to add is that it's it's not only a question of, of the storage of the private keys, it's also the way they're signing, how secure the execution binding is, but also even aside from all of that, when the keys are first generated, the way the digital signatures, the so-called loop the curve DSA, uh, the, the way it works is there's a, a one-time use key also. And there have been bad software, there are cases of, of faulty software, like in Android, uh, so those those keys were, were constant, and that and you have a double whammy on the blockchain. You can see all that stuff publicly, so you could see when there was reuse of that key, and so you could steal from somebody's wallet without ever getting into their wallet. So that this is actually uh, happening in multiple ways. Oh, really Anything from you? <clears throat> So I actually saw this afternoon where the thumb got hacked for 30 million and said they'd reimburse everyone. Which um, one? The, the thumb had a big thumb, huh? So uh, everyone's so flush right now they can spare 30 million. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> right, how, how many bitcoins is that? It's what, you know, not that many. 3,000? <laughs> um, so taking this up back high level, uh, if you own cryptocurrency, the question is where do you store it? Right? And so it's really easy to store it on an exchange, but that exchange can get hacked. Exchanges don't have to reimburse you like a bank does. A big bank gets robbed, they reimburse you. The exchange gets hacked, they don't have to. What we're seeing now is they want to, obviously, uh, and they try to if they can. Um, there is a very you know, impassioned group of people who say, if you don't control your private keys, you don't own your coin, which is technically true. Um, but there is risk in that. So just like exchanges can get hacked, uh, you as an individual can get hacked, uh, really with no recourse. So there is not a great answer of what to do and how to store it. So one thing that is pretty clever is to have a hot wallet and a cold wallet. A hot wallet is you know, what you use for maybe day-to-day -day purchases. Is someone using crypto day-to-day? -day? Whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, lightning network. Okay. David H. Buying coffee with Lightning Network. Ooh. Uh, uh, nice. <laughs> and there's something called cold wallet, which never touches the internet, but that means you need to have a computer that just, you know, is not ever going to touch the internet, which a lot of people don't have. Trezor Wallet does that for you. Uh, but there's not a great way to store coins for your average person right now, which is why most people keep it on the exchange. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing. I think that's what everyone's saying. Uh, there's risks to any way you store it right now. Okay, yeah, I mean, one of them was the My Ether, My Ether Wall, which was hacked in April. Um, so if any, if any of you guys know exactly sort of what happened there, what uh, what happened there, and if you can talk about that for a little bit, so should people who have Ethereum be concerned? Uh, what are the general sort of lessons from something like that? Uh, 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say think twice about just trusting any kind of piece of software or or an exchange. Uh, there's a certain level of responsibility that comes with possessing the keys to all of your money. I mean, it's like anything that can, that's powerful, right? Guns, drugs, whatever, right? Like there's a level of responsibility that comes with possessing or, or participating in whatever activity. And in this case, it's transmitting large amounts of money. So, you know, you don't just go, oh, you know, my, the, my buddy down the street said he'll hold on to it for me. That sounds legit. You know, like, you should probably vet it. And I think the, I, I'm really interested that no traditional banks have voiced any indication that they're going to go in this direction. Because we already trust them with lots of stuff. They, they've figured out how to store physical things securely, the safe deposit boxes, things like that. But our money system is all electronic. They know how to protect bits. And they have a mitigation system for you know the, the risk that goes involved that's involved with all that. So I'm surprised that there isn't a traditional bank that says we're going to start doing digital safe deposit boxes and figuring that out. I'm, I'm surprised it hasn't happened. Yeah, I, I think the exchange is already doing that. So Zappo is doing that, right? They're amazing. Like they've got this vault in the middle of Swiss Mountain. But my point is, is who is Zappo? If it was, you know. JP Morgan Chase, right? I know who they are. But who's Zappo? I mean, yeah, they're probably great. But how long have they been around? I mean, have they been around long enough to issue, you know, what is it, Schedule D shares? <laughs> like, what do you have to have two years of financials or something like that? I mean, are they are they that old? Yes, they actually used to be one block from here. Uh, and they're like, they and Coinbase and others have insurance on the crypto holdings. Huh. So yeah. that can give you like a little bit of a warm, fuzzy feeling that if there's an issue, they are insured. Um, not necessarily though, because sometimes the insurance claim can be denied, which is always fun. Uh, I've, we've seen that. But yeah, there's not a great answer. But no, yeah, I mean, this becomes a societal problem at some level. And um, yeah, I, I just am surprised that some of the larger institutions that have been around for hundreds of years haven't stepped up and said, you know, we're going we're gonna to get into this space because. Someone needs to lend credibility to it. Well, so there the central banks are banks. Credit, let, me, let me clarify. Yeah. Credibility to storing digital assets, not credibility to cryptocurrencies necessarily, but like the idea of a digital safe deposit box. I can store my photos in it if I wanted to, but this idea that there's data that's valuable to us, we want to have access to it over a long period of time, and we want it to be secure in a way that makes it hard to steal or destroy. Right. That's what I, I, I didn't mean. The banks are going to lend credibility to cryptocurrencies. Well, I mean, they are. They, they are looking at fiat versions of the cryptocurrency. But one of the problem, one of the issues we haven't really touched on yet, is this whole money laundering issue. The whole, the whole, the whole issue of what Bitcoin and some of these cryptocurrencies are used for, and that uh, for those kind of uh, you know, like buy, buying uh, stolen data sets after these you know large database breaches, buying these data sets. Or, or from the dark web using, using Bitcoin or, or holding yeah, hospital people use, the People buy drugs with cash and they buy guns, illegal guns with cash. I mean, that's not new. That's That doesn't make cryptocurrencies illegitimate. There's two ways to look at it. People are using it like we've always used it. Well, there's two ways to look at it. I was on a panel recently in, like, in Dubai and then one of the leads of, our, of, of the smart Dubai government there, he said, he thinks it would be great if everyone was using Bitcoin because then if, if the governments can get into that, if, you know, whether the exchanges or elsewhere, if they can get your, if all the transactions, these, these uh, 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 illegal transactions are happening through, through Bitcoin, then it's like one thing that governments need to, to get into in order to, in order to, to figure out what's going on. So there's, there's various ways to look at it. But we know that there's been an uptick uh, in ransomware, definitely, once, once Bitcoin began. began no for sure. But the idea that we use money as part of criminal enterprise has been around forever. Yes, obviously. We're just using the newest money. Right. But that doesn't make the newest money any more Ill like, illegitimate now because, you know what I'm saying? Like, we've always used cash and we've always used other things for, for criminal enterprise too. That it, we didn't 
we never stop to think, oh, maybe cash is bad. I mean, like maybe dollars are bad because people can buy drugs with them. You know what I mean? Like but, my point is, is this is just humans and money. But but what the other side of that coin, if you will, of, of this uh, sort of anonymity uh, is the issue that you don't have the recourse, right? I, get, I mean, you are giving up what you get with credit cards. You're, you're, you know, if you're, as was talked about before, if, you, if, you're, if your private keys are compromised, or you're, you're stuck. I mean, so. <laughs> so, I would say, actually, I agree with David. And actually, I didn't think I'd agree with this David, but uh, as a, we work with a lot of banks and exchanges, and there's a huge reputational risk and regulatory risk. So if I am storing your Bitcoin, and your Bitcoin are coming from ransomware, and I can, I can hold them, then I have an obligation to freeze them which is something that banks aren't prepared to do right now. Yeah. And banks, let's be honest here, are not at the forefront of technology, especially U.S. banks. They're at the not forefront. Well, we, <laughs> want, we want them to be. Right, but they're definitely not there yet. Yeah. And so to expect them there, even you know the banks that work with crypto firms, which are very, very few, I don't know if anyone actually works with a crypto company here, it's hard to get a bank account. There's only a few banks that do it and work with them. I'm a USAA customer, <laughs> very specifically, because <clears throat> I was showing people earlier on the app. I've got, I log in, if you look at my accounts, it's got Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, US dollars, like all listed in the app. Right, but to be an exchange, you get a bank account, it's actually very hard. Only oh, I know, banks, I guess what you're saying. Yeah, if you're an exchange, yeah. 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 Um, even if you've done an ICO and you want to get a bank account, sometimes it's hard, because people are saying, well, how'd you get $20 million? Like, Drugs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. how'd you raise all your Bitcoin? <laughs> Who'd you raise it from? You're like, well, we don't know. They're like. Ooh. <laughs> so so I, I, I mind it. <laughs> uh, so I could see that it's, when you first pitched it, I was like, that's a great idea. Banks should just have like a safety deposit box. And then I thought more of how banks operate. And that's Wait, you have to clarify that it's not them storing your bitcoins. They are a service for storing digital data, unspecified digital data. Could it include Bitcoin? Though? It could include your cryptographic keys which are you know, the private keys for your Bitcoin addresses, sure. But I think the way they get around looking like they're storing your Bitcoins and having that fiduciary and legal responsibility is like we're just doing digital lock boxes. Yeah. The risk is not worth it, the short answer. Yeah. Like even if it were just photos? Even if it was just photos, just the, the possibility that it could be something bad, because you have to go to explain to your regulator, right? Either it's going to be OCC or it's going to be whoever, and you're going to explain, I've got this new product that no one's ever had seen before, and it could be used. But it's a safe deposit box, though. Yeah, like, this is a product they've been doing for hundreds of years. Right, but uh, it's the digital goods that could be tracked. So again, someone could go to them and say, you know, like, uh, you could do a 314A um, or 314B from a FinCEN. So what you're saying is there's a legal framework now that basically says they can't do it because it's digital. Not that they couldn't do it, but there's simply more risk to them, and it's not worth it. Well, what if I printed my private keys on a piece of paper and put them in a physical lockbox? Then and a safe deposit box in a bank. I mean, it's the same thing. I can etch them on a piece of metal, yeah. not to say I have, <laughs> and put them in a safe deposit box at a real bank, physically. How is that any different? The bank then has no visibility of what's in the safe deposit box? They won't know what's in it, because what they're going to get from me are encrypted blocks. Because I don't want you looking at my photos. Yeah. No, I, That's what I'm saying. Like there, there is a way for them to say, "Look, we are really good at this. We'll send, you know, just send us encrypted data and we'll store it." I mean, Amazon does this already. S3. Yeah. It's still metadata. It's kind of encrypted, but you know, it introduces so many other issues. No. Just saying. Forward thinking. <laughs> but if it's encrypted data, you still have the the security problem of the keys that encrypted the data. Yeah, of course, right. So, so I mean, are you just moving? Are you just yeah. moving the target around? Targeting all the way down. <laughs> so here, this is awesome reference. Yeah, I would say, from my experience with banks, I don't think they're going to do it. It is a cool idea, but I mean, I already do it with S three. Amazon's yeah. my bank now. They're in my digital safe deposit box. <clears throat> this is fantastic because you guys are paneling yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it works perfect. You just do the work. You just sit back. Okay, so kind of jumping off from that a little bit, Vanish raised the question that we talked about, sort of. Uh, um, uh, why can't we buy, well, 
I know what you're going to say. But why can't we? Why can't we buy? You're going to say I can't buy a cup of coffee. But why can't? Why, why can't everybody do it yet? So what, what's, what are some of the things that are keeping us from doing it yet? What are some of the areas that need to be researched more before we? Um, before you talk about a Steve Jobs like moment. Um, so Van Sheer, what do you what do you think? Um, so I think there are two big issues that are preventing uh, cryptocurrencies from becoming uh, as mainstream as we would all want to be. Want to be. Um, one is lack of stability, and the other one is lack of uh, um, sustainability, right? Um, or the, sorry, scalability. Um, not just for cryptocurrencies, but for any currency you like, uh, that there will there there is a decent amount of stability and it shouldn't fluctuate its value shouldn't fluctuate too much, and we are still not there yet. Um, and uh, scalability is also very important uh, for it to be mainstream purely. But uh, right now, uh, Bitcoin uh, network is uh, processing maybe around seven transactions per second somewhere around. Um, and, it, and, and on the other hand, a centralized system like Visa is uh, processing tens of thousands of transactions per second. So we are nowhere um, uh, being close to becoming main, mainstream for cryptocurrencies. I guess I would say that, at least in this part of the world, I don't really necessarily, I know you'll disagree, but I don't necessarily see a crying need to use Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee. There's some, I mean, not that you're going to return the coffee and try to get your money back, but, but there's so many Apple Pay, there's so many other ways. We have so many other, especially on its higher amounts, where, where you do want the dispute resolution, and you don't want to be responsible for for losing you know, the equivalent of your credit card. Right? So I, I see in, in countries that don't have all the infrastructure that we have, it's it's a great way to go, but, uh, but I don't I don't necessarily besides the scalability and the, the, the crypto and the technical and the security issues I don't I don't know if the average consumer is unless they be in it for the speculative aspects of the you know as an investment thing but yeah. in terms of buying a couple of yeah yeah you know. right. any other comments from from Dave or yeah. I'll I'll jump in here. I think that most people, when they start using Bitcoin for the first time, they won't know it. Um, and I think it's because it's going to come in the, in the it's going to be packaged by a major on online relay, retailer. I think that something like the Lightning Network is going to um, make the democratization of Bitcoins a thing. Uh, I think it's going to be our primary way of getting around. The crypto, like the wallets problem that we were just talking about. Like maybe we don't need a Steve Jobs moment when it comes to handling crypto keys. Maybe it's more going along with these. So for those of you who don't know about the Lightning Network, um, it's a micropayments channel network built on top of Bitcoin. So it basically allows us to trade IOUs um, and build a network of those so that I can pay, you know, I can pay David here, but it goes through you know, a mutual acquaintance of ours, right? Securely. And what I think what will happen is a major online retailer will probably say, you know what, this is how we're gonna save on transaction fees. Uh, and we're going to make it easy for remittances around the world this way. We're going to make it easy to buy and sell things to each other and to other retailers. And because of their position in this payments network, they, they would be ideally positioned to aggregate these to a big enough I don't, I don't think um, amounts that actual, like doing actual Bitcoin transactions to move the money makes sense, right? But for the rest of us, it'll just be like, oh, I've got whatever credits or whatever, you know, like you have coupons or whatever. I don't, I think, you know, it, it sounds odd, it sounds a bit out there, but I think a lot of us will start using Bitcoins and not actually know we're doing it. So do you mean for a remote? Because like, the, 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 the initial question was about a cup of, cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. so, so that's what I, mean. words, I guess I guess the point I was trying to make is for a physical in-person transaction, it's easy to use Apple Pay or your credit card or whatever. I mean, in other words, you, yeah, don't, have to think, you don't have to think about it. There's not, nothing to type in or... And it will be just as easy, it already is that easy with uh, the Lightning Network. It's just QR codes, it's like, and it's done. Okay, but what is the, why, what, why would a consumer want to use that versus what they're using now, in, at least in the US? Because things will be cheaper, because the retailers won't be paying the, what is it, 3% the Visa charges. 
But does the consumer does the consumer care? Is the price of coffee gonna go? Is Starbucks gonna charge less for the coffee potentially? Or it could be more of a social thing, like oh, we're gonna give more tips to our baristas, or you know, we're gonna be able to provide better benefits or a better product. I mean, every retailer, every business is gonna be able to decide how to, to apply that savings, whether they lower the price or they they pay the workers more. It's up to them. But I think just from convenience, it'll be no different than any other payment system. And what you're going to have is an incentive for retailers to push it because they don't have to pay somebody else the three percent to process payments. So, what do you see happening to credit card companies? They were pro they will probably jump in because they have to. Okay. No, no more entry. So, um, going back to the main reason why uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, why people were excited about cryptocurrencies, right? The anti-censorship part of it, right? Uh, maybe you're right, David, that um, we will never be uh, to a, come to a situation where uh, cryptocurrency-based transactions will be as easy as Apple Pay transactions. However, um, uh, the um, value addition, the value addition of using cryptocurrencies can be uh, on the side of it, like you were saying, that um, people will be excited about anti-censorship. Um, value proposition of cryptocurrencies and they would want to go take that one step uh, further uh, in uh, using so, cryptocurrency. All right, so when you say anti because I can see if it involves like your purchase of something that Maybe you, you, you don't even want your spouse to know about it. But I mean, when you're buying a cup of coffee, they're, they're, it doesn't seem like there's a privacy tracking. There's not, there's not a big tracking issue. Well, why not? Because uh, let's say Let's say, okay, so let's say um, you buy something from a cafeteria at Shepherd uh, at yeah. here, and uh, uh, I also see a transaction from Dark Matter uh, to the same public key. Uh, well, that's, you know, or, but you don't want to do, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't want to do your key management that way. You don't want to use the same public keys for, for those two. What is it? Where are you going? <laughs> yeah. so, uh, my point is that the, um, that the, there is still a, a value addition of using cryptocurrencies uh, on a day-to-day -day transactions, even if it's not, you know. Um, I, yeah, I guess I would play the devil's advocate. I would say, is, like, when, well, I don't personally have a Facebook account, I guess, because I worry about the privacy, the, the aspects of the security, but, but people give away so much of their lives in social networking. Are they really gonna all of a sudden say, because we don't have any other alternative. Well, I think what David may be saying is security, well, no, privacy has never sold a product. Like, people don't buy products because, oh my gosh, my privacy is better. Because if that were true, they would, nobody would use Facebook. And the fact they're willing to give up their privacy for, right? Uh, I, I like what you're saying. I agree with you. <laughs> but the sad truth of being, you know, an anti-surveillance yeah. guy for years is that you know, I tell my mom like, "No, you should use this browser because it's so much better about your privacy." She'd be like, eh, "I don't." Yeah. I mean, until Cambridge Analytica and all this stuff, I don't know. If, I don't know if the average person realized how much they were giving up using mm. things like Facebook. <laughs> yeah. But um, only if you have to spend more to go to uh, cryptocurrencies, right? If you have, if it is, uh, if it is apples to apples, then then why not, right? <laughs> well, Lightning Network is apples to apples. In fact, it's arguably easier. No, it, it runs oh, now. Just, yeah. just look it up. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to you know, try and keep on lighting firecrackers on you guys so you, 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 you know, have your little back and forth here. Um, so you're Bitcoin bullish. You, you think that in five to ten years, Bitcoin shall be the the, uh, the 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 uh, currency of the of the land. <clears throat> no, no. Tell me what you think, and I know David disagrees, and I'll, I'll try to have something to say. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. Um, <laughs> this is the first time I've ever said this in public, but personally, this is not reflecting my employer or anything. I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I, I think that ultimately, what's that? Bitcoin maximalist. It, it is the one and true cryptocurrency. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> okay. So Bitcoin's not a scam. It's, it's, it's not, not a scam. scam here. It's not a scam. Um, but. I, and I can't claim to have this idea, or the reason why I think this is. It actually comes from a podcast called The Noted Podcast, N-O-D-E-D. -E -E. I recommend you guys all go look that one up. The, the hosts of that one are sages. Uh, they're Bitcoin maximalists for sure, but they, 
they talk a lot about the socioeconomic effects of honest money, like money that can't be manipulated by governments. It's not about, oh my gosh, crypto, blah, blah, blah. It's more of like, how it will affect us in an everyday life. And the one that really- in general. Well, but Bitcoin specifically, like what honest money will do to people's time, you know, preferences and their time outlooks. And um, the one that really just blew my mind was a couple episodes ago, they talked to a guy from Africa, he was educated in the US, went back to Africa, runs a bank in Africa. And he was talking about how he's trying to convince or is having some success convincing African countries to try to build sovereign wealth funds in Bitcoins. Since they don't have gold, but they have sunlight and they do have hydropower, like they could participate in, in the hashing of Bitcoins and actually build a sovereign fund in Bitcoins that they could then borrow against in the international money markets and, and like drag their country's infrastructure out of you know the post-colonial hell that it's in. And it really stuck with me because like proof of work is like that old adage, you know, you work hard enough to get ahead. It's, it's the one consensus mechanism that's purely democratizing and actually cuts against sort of the post-colonialist status quo in the world where you have these like third world countries who have dams could be mining bitcoins. They don't have gold or the, you know, the oil they have which doesn't, isn't owned by them, the diamonds they have aren't owned by them. This is the one thing that they could use, bitcoin, to democratize the wealth of the world. And I think that's going to resonate a lot with people you know, all over the world. And I think that we're gonna start seeing a participation in the global economy like we've never seen before. Um, and because of Bitcoin size, I think it's going to, like we've always seen in, in human networks, right? The first movers, like you have, a, you have a first mover advantage, right? I think it's going to, you know, what do they call that? Selective attachment, preferential attachment. Right? I, I think there's definitely a, a potential here that Bitcoin will become the currency because it's not the currency that is manipulated by a, a few governments in the world. Thoughts? Yeah, Neil? Um, uh, just a quick uh, point that the, um, I, I, what, what does he make sense, um, like we were discussing, uh, <laughs> the other side of it, the, though, is the um, cost, uh, is, is the, uh, you're buying from your buck, right? So, um, what, what is the investment you're going to put in, what is it you're using it for, what, what it is that you're using for, um, the investment is the proof of work, and what you're using it for can be many business use cases. So we need to um, kind of uh, uh, see if the bank for buck is uh, reasonable. I mean, a narrow example would be: what if they use some percentage of their hydroelectric power to generate bitcoins, which then allowed them to actually maintain an electrical grid that was stable in, in the third world country, yeah. Yeah. right? Sure. Like. They can use that to pay for that network, and and then it's something they struggle with today. You know, pick any one of these countries where the power is only on for three hours a day. You know, that kind of thing. That's what I'm getting, at. and I think that's hugely attractive. So to me, okay, it sounds nice in theory, but kind of the things that I worry about is now your your medical wearables, whatever you're doing, some life and death types of transactions, uh, and now things are not. You, you've cut down on your comp compute power because you're under attack because because your cycles are being stolen to, to mine bitcoins. So, so you're saying that my my so, pacemaker is going to mine mine bitcoins for somebody well, else. What I'm saying is <laughs> is maybe a pacemaker is not is you know is not that powerful a unit it may not pay, but maybe the the, the nine one one system the the Let's say decentralized 911 system that your that your pacemaker is trying to contact either directly or to or peer to peer to well to well devices. So now people can die because I mean so I think there's a lot to consider is that a cryptocurrency is not the be all and end all of, of our societal issues. And if it becomes profitable to attack computers on a wholesale basis in order in order to mine. Uh, I I, yeah. I think of this as like the electric electrification of the world. I think of this as a new age. It's a, it's a larger, more I guess lower down change of a, of a societal system. It's our money. But it's in the U.S., it's not. 
But for environmental reasons and others, right, the, the kind of thing you're talking about in some of these countries to use their dams or whatever, I mean, <laughs> to generate electricity. That's not, it's not necessarily a viable model. Why would it be? Well, we, we do have, I mean, they're, we they're do have networks. environmental considerations in the U.S. Well, the dams exist, and it would be, are you, yeah. Okay. So, so you're I, saying I we can produce them. massive amounts of electricity without any... Dams exist all over the world, including in Africa, and I would argue in a lot of developing countries where they have failing electrical grids, okay. the electricity they generate goes unused. But we have blackouts now in our major cities without without well, worrying about that's due to network failures, and, and actually the last ones we had were due to financial manipulations by like Enron. Right? That was the last time we've ever had like persistent rolling brownouts and stuff, right? If I remember, I mean, when was the last one? Where we were all like, oh, geez, it's summertime, all the electricity is not. It happens in my townhouse in San Jose. And, yeah, I mean, it's an old, different town. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's a new townhouse. But, Maybe because like, I live in the shadow of a giant but, dam, and I don't worry about <laughs> it. <this. laughs> yeah. <All right>. yeah. <laughs> well, so we've got about five minutes to go before you guys are going to ask any questions. So just uh, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, think of them now. Um, let's, let's move on to, um, I could continue to go on, on to Bitcoin and, and stuff like that, but let's talk about um, Distributed ledgers with businesses. So some of you work with that um, enterprise blockchain. So not not just consumers or individuals. And you know companies and their blockchains. How are, so? What are some of the, the security problems for that? Um, how do you get companies to you know integrate distributed ledger uh, technology into whatever system they have already? What, what are the concerns around all that? So just to sort of maybe dumb it, dumb it down for some of us and explain it a bit. So when we're talking about those kinds of applications for we're often talking about these aspects of it to be so-called permission blockchains. So all the stuff we talk about proof of work, <coughs> but that consensus that's method, just money. That does not apply. Yeah. And so, uh, but the other thing is, is that when I look at the privacy aspects, I look at the privacy aspects of, of consumers, like like we talked about you and I, <laughs> like in your in your in your house, if if, uh, if someone can tell when you're not at home because of all your devices are not, you know are not being used, that they're not doing their blockchain transactions. So I claim that when you're worried about privacy, whether it's at the corporate, the enterprise level, uh, or the consumer level, because one issue is for the economy of scale, so we're not talking about sort of a single blockchain like Bitcoin, but rather a given group of banks, say, run their, their, their little type of ledger fabric or whatever it is, and so they're, they're by, by the very nature, to get the efficiencies, they're competitors of one another. So for regulatory reasons and others, the privacy or the lack of leaking information in the city banks is doing transactions with Bank of America, uh, Wells Fargo is not supposed to be privy to that. One solution to that, uh, like this uh, R3 quarter, is, is not to use a true blockchain, is, is not to make the, block, the transactions, even though they're encrypted, available to everyone. And the kind of work that I've been doing, I think there's a positive to, to having encrypted transactions available to, to everyone because it allows certain things like for regulatory reasons, it allows the introduction of an audit, an audit capability uh, so that you don't have to worry about where, where they get the transactions from. All the transactions are out there. They can be verified by everyone, but unless you have a need to know, you can't really get, get them back and uh, decrypt them. Any more thoughts on enterprise blockchains and security issues around that? Uh, just following up on uh, what they said, uh, privacy being one of the main uh, problems uh, businesses face when they uh, integrate their current systems with uh, uh, distributed ledgers. Um, so, with diff different use cases, we have uh, different security models, and uh, we will need different uh, potentially consensus algorithms and, and uh, specific uh, cryptographic uh, protocols and schemes uh, to make uh, to get the privacy we want for that business use case. And uh, uh, the cryptography community, uh, like David mentioned, uh, has been um, is, is uh, aware of the fact, and there has been a line of research uh, trying to design new privacy mechanisms that work for different, uh, different uh, uh, use cases. One example, very recent example, is uh, um, a new uh, technique called bulletproof systems that. Uh, um, that uh, Professor Dan Boney uh, and his colleagues uh, designed at Stanford University. And um, Monero uh, just readily uh, adopted it. Um, so it, it just shows that um, uh, you know, uh, 
the businesses are uh, ready uh, to uh, they're hungry to uh, for new uh, privacy um, solutions, new ideas, and uh, because that is a big problem. Um, Any other thoughts, Neil, or do? I mean, in the enterprise, the most enterprises are centralized. They're siloed, top down. There's a team that manages all of the security and the credentials and all that stuff. So when you go into these enterprises and you say, no, 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 everything's going to be decentralized now. And, and more importantly, your biggest competitor, who you have to cooperate at some nominal level, is also going to be on the network. Right? This becomes a huge challenge. Um, but there can be huge gains as well. I mean, any kind of horizontal or vertical integration in any industry can greatly benefit from these provision networks. Networks where you have like an already uh, an economic or um, legal relationship. Um, I mean, one of the industries that's it's kind of interesting because it's brand new um, is able to leverage. They're building everything from scratch right now. They're able to leverage the latest and greatest technology, and that's the cannabis industry in the United States. And they are rolling out blockchains for all the regulatory compliance. They everything from every time they do a weigh-in in their their processing. Of, of cannabis products, you know, that, that gets recorded, gets put in blockchain and stuff. And so, like, the states that have allowed it to happen have these very strict reporting requirements. And a lot of the cannabis industry is like, great, here's our blockchain, look. You know, and they, they check each other, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, audit capabilities, like you were saying, and, and, and they're able to um, basically trace everything down to where, oh, where did we lose that, that one ounce of of cannabis, they can actually look at the blockchain and get there. I mean, I, that's not, I wouldn't say it's operational today, but it's where they're headed. Uh, it's an it's a industry that's enthusiastically embracing this technology. Um, but to add on to this, uh, this thought, uh, you know, the, per the permissionless blockchains, like Bitcoins and stuff, that's just currency. But the rest of the world is a permissioned network. Like, you have to prove who you are all the time to get a bank account to, I mean, unless it's like a pure cash only transaction, um, you have to prove who you are. And both parties do. And there's a, some kind of traceability. Um, and what we're finding with these permission networks is that its primary, I would guess probably its greatest use is in transmitting trust. So it, we're taking the last of the human scale operations, which is trust, and computerizing it. So right now we still have things like notary publics and we have lawyers and judges, and I'm not saying the legal system is going to go away, not at all. But when we have to go and have something notarized, or I have to show uh, my driver's license to prove that I'm 21 years old or older to, to buy alcohol, these are things that are trust-based and they can be done with a computer now. So I could have, so I live in Nevada, and I could have a verifiable claim issued to me by the DMV that says I'm older than 21. When I go into a bar, I can show them a QR code, they scan it, it has my picture, big green check mark comes up. They don't have to know how old I am, which is privacy preserving, but they just have to know that I'm older than 21. And then they have done their, you know, we may have to change some laws, but then, you know, they would be able to say they did their due diligence in verifying my age. So that's a trust <coughs> transmission mechanism. And um, I think that's going to be the big revolution that comes out of these, these um, permission numbers. Yeah, I just, so just to briefly just add, beyond trust transmission, one of the areas that I've been researching is the reputation aspects and how blockchain, whether it's prices or, and or uses, how you can import trust from, in, import trust and reputation from uh, using you know, your physical device and, you know, which manufacturer it is, or, or, or your certificates that give your identity. But then as you transact on the blockchain, uh, your reputational aspects can go down a lot. And so, so because the way I look at it, the goal eventually is just like, you know, your next door neighbors, eventually you, you can know how much to trust a device or a person thousands of miles away from you. And, and to yeah. All right, let's uh, get some questions from the audience. Raise your hand. All right, start with you over here. Yeah, a comment or a question. I think the use case about the coffee is really if you travel from airports around the world and you got to get a cup of coffee, you don't have a currency, you got to put it on a credit card and the four transaction fee every two and a half percent. So if you have a split, for instance, a, a gift card that worked at every airport in the world that seems to use, exactly. 
Um, but if you don't it's right now, and Bitcoin would be a great solution where you could use it all convenience stores, it wouldn't matter where you're at. So, I'm so for anybody who travels, it seems to be a, a gimme. Buying Starbucks or putting money into my Starbucks account with the Lightning Network, if it doesn't exist now, it will in two days. If somebody's watching it, that's how to do this. I mean, we're starting to see these Lightning gateways pop up everywhere. I mean, like, like there's a silliest thing the other day, like someone tweeted out that, hey, we should have this, like, let's all play a video game collectively kind of thing, and you have to pay with a uh, Lightning Network to be able to move the character in the game, and surprisingly, thousands of people jumped on and started using it. I mean, it's just that convenient. I, I don't know. My, my, my question really is really around security, and getting back to that, and that, you know, the my Ether hack and the Binance were, were nothing to do with the wonderful encryption you've got everybody at that. Yeah. It had nothing to do with that. No. And the DNS hack, the Binance thing was a phishing redirect hack. It had nothing to do with cryptography. My real question is, is what do you, you know, I'd like to hear all you guys idea about you know, quantum computing and with a threat of that and with cryptography. The 51%, I guess? No, 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 quantum, quantum computing, computing is different. different. Okay. Yeah, so one thing that, that I'm looking at at, at, at Dark Matter is, is to migrate over. So as as you're building your, your blockchain, if you can stay ahead of the curve and have rep, have have a version of it that's using the latest cryptography, and so you can adapt that over. Because it depends on the type of transactions. But if they're like documents, or you might need to retain uh, the history of that and to be able to, to come back to it. Because one one big fallacy with blockchain is people talk about. Uh, well, it's immutable. They, they, you know, what people forget about is the fact that the, gar what, the garbage in, garbage out concept is even if it's immutable, but depending on the nature of the smart contract, the, na the nature of the transaction, maybe that transaction was never valid. Even though now it's immutable and you can't change it, maybe that <coughs> transaction ever should have been approved in the first place. So that's one of the big areas of, 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 of security. And, and so quantum, we, we need to stay ahead of it Head of, head of the curve on where we are. Are we five years away? Are we ten years away of worrying about it, or three years away? So it, it depends also what your it depends also whether it's authentication or confidentiality. So if it's data that you're worried about getting exposed that you're transmitting now, and that data the, the privacy of that data has value ten years from now, then you have to worry about this sooner than if you're using it for the active case of, of authenticating the transaction. How about hashing? So hashing the way I don't want to go, yeah, yeah, but the way hash, the hashing is is uh, hashing and symmetric key cryptography is is much less vulnerable. To yeah. Do any yeah. of you guys have anything quick to say? Yeah, I was gonna say hashing is probably gonna be the easiest to fix. The the biggest threat from quantum computers is in key exchange, which you don't have to do to participate in like cryptocurrencies. Um, but real quick, I, I think the the first sign that someone has a viable quantum computer. Uh, will be that Satoshi's Bitcoins will move. Um, and I don't think that means it's the end of the Bitcoin era. You just uh, take the, the hash of the most recent block, you sign it with a post quantum algorithm, you say there's the checkpoint that becomes the new genesis block for the new blockchain going forward that uses post quantum algorithms. Um, all the Hyperledger <coughs> blockchains encode which algorithms they use in configuration transactions, so they're actually much more portable than something like Bitcoin. They're going to have to roll out a new version of Bitcoin to support these. But with like with the permission networks and Hyperledger specifically, you can just plug in a post quantum crypto algorithm and it gets entered in as a transaction, and we just keep going. But that's because you're only worried about the authentication. It's not the privacy of the data. Well, because you shouldn't store data in a blockchain. That's just that's a well-known rule. Like you only store the fingerprints and the pointers, right? You don't ever store anything in a blockchain that you can't that you don't ever want to be public because crypto has a shelf life. So you store things like, hey, the data is over here, and here's the hash of it. Right. But, but even if you're doing key agreement on the blockchain, that that's a separate. Thing. Yeah, you don't want to do key. I mean, yeah. It's key exchange that's, that's susceptible. Okay. Uh, either you two have you? No, nope, you're good. All right, next, you. Um, so, any thoughts on the current uh, climate of ICO in the US? So, even though in the US, you know, it has always been, especially not in California, it's been a hotbed of uh, raising capital, but when it comes to ICO, we are still definitely in a lagging, right? So, my uh, question is do you see uh, it's going to be a viable alternative for you know companies uh, raising capital? And what are your thoughts on I uh, read news that Indiegogo, which is a crowdfunding platform, so they are moving to a more quote unquote liberal ICO model. 
so, you know, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, so we, at this point, we've helped 175 ICOs, so we know a little bit. Um, US regular, regular market is bumpy, right? Carney's, Secretary Carney's comments at the beginning of the year scared a lot of people, so there was a huge stop in ICOs in the US, and he said, I've never seen an ICO that's been with security. Um, Recent comments at the Yahoo Finance Summit seem to back away from that. So what we're seeing now is there was a very, like, there was not a hard stop, but there was definitely a lull in US ICOs that is now picking up again. It seems like with the latest comments, uh, we're in a good shape from the SEC on the whole utility token versus security perspective. So what we expect is this year a, kind of like a ramp up of ICOs. Obviously the price of coins is keeping, it's kind of taking the damper on things. When Bitcoin is trading at 15,000, Everyone wanted to do an ICO. Now it's at 6,800. It's sad. Uh, and there's less of it. Um, so you're mad that it's $6,000 <laughs> higher than it was like, 18 months ago? Uh, but the, the regulatory purposes, the SEC, I think, is sorted. The only big concern right now is FinCEN. So FinCEN came out something called the Widen Letter at the end of last year, the beginning, that said, per March 2014 guidance, um, if you exchange, like, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and you get a token back, that is an MSB, money service business. To be a money service business in the US, it takes you like at least three years and several million dollars to get licensed for each state. If FinCEN acts up, it will kill the ICO market in the US. If they say you are doing an ICO and you're an MSB, it will kill it. But they haven't done it yet and the SEC seems kind of placated. So right now is actually a very good time, I would say, to do an ICO and we're seeing like a ramp up that was a very long answer. You were just fine. Great. Um, your turn. Well, actually, I have a few comments. Uh, first of all, my comment is that we are talking about blockchain and Bitcoin as if blockchain is the future and is the real thing. We are so late in adopting this whole technology. The other parts of the world, there are a lot of things that are happening. For example, Japan has 250,000 stores who accept cryptocurrency. They are doing it successfully. Whatever issues there are, they have solved it. There are thousands of ICOs happening in other parts of the world. And uh, I'll make a statement which you guys may not like. Blockchain has a lot of weaknesses, we know that. I mean, if you go into architecture, it is not scalable, it's got some transmission issues. My portfolio company is developing a new protocol which we are going to release sometime in July. The white paper is going to come out. Uh, it's called Big Lattice. It's Tokyo Lattice Structure, Neural Networks. It has addressed all the issues which blockchain has. The blockchain, as far as US is concerned, is going to be dead before even it becomes alive because US is so behind the rest of the world you know, in involving blockchain. Yeah. Am I right there? Okay, so your question is real quick. My question is that uh, <laughs> why are we discussing all these things? Because Bitcoin is definitely going to bite the dust. Oh, it's well, I, I, I I'll have all your bitcoins. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll send you a, an address you can just send. If you don't want them anymore, I'll take it. Oh, I, I trade. I trade. So, so, so. Well, I, I trade in arbitrage, so I make money no matter where it goes. Okay. Well, I because I've been focusing on issues like IoT and smart cities and these applications, I, in my view, cryptocurrency is just a small part of the applications of blockchain. Of course, of course. So yeah. that's, that's one reason yeah. why I'm and, and we spend so much time on cryptocurrency and not on uh, I, oh, uh, I would disagree with you on that. I mean, Hyperledger is huge. We have hundreds of corporate sponsors. We're building solutions everywhere and everything else other than money, right? And and actually, some of them are even money related. But I, I agree with David here. I, I mean, that there's just so much more potential in the rest of the world. I work for Hyperledger and not in a Bitcoin company on purpose, right? I believe in Bitcoin, but I think there's so much more good everyday good. In can get out of these permission networks applying, you know, the trust transmission. Okay, we're going to move on. Your turn. Uh, so, David, you mentioned um, about this use case of uh, putting identity or uh, age on blockchain and being verified by the bar. Um, so, would you say that uh, in that case you're still trusting the government to do the validation of someone's identity, and that person at the bar would just like scan their QR code to like retrieve the digital file of the identity? So in a sense that there's still that sense of trust anchored in this use case. And in a lot of use cases, I think, uh, for example, like in between organizations and institutions, uh, when the identities of each other are already known, like there are like 12 players, 12 banks together. So when you already know each other's identities, like what do you think is the biggest value out of blockchain since there's already some assumption of trust? Um, because we can put everybody's identity, we can enroll them into like a public utility 
for transmitting trust, like identity or accreditation. And then we can automate so much of the things that are done in paperwork now. Like, for instance, when I apply for a job, and I say, oh, I have, like, I have a degree in computer science from the University of Washington. I put that on my resume. But does an employee ever, employer ever check that? No, because uh, maybe. No, I've spent millions doing that in my career. They absolutely <laughs> Well, OK. They I sometimes don't... pay third parties. Maybe. But they always call the university and verify dates. I can tell you for sure. Oh, OK. Well, um, so there's a, a pilot program coming out of the Sovereign uh, network right now where universities starting to issue verifiable claims that you do have the academic credentials you have. I mean, it, that kind of thing can, can make at least reduce, I mean, what did you just say? You've spent millions of dollars yeah, doing in HR, that? yes. I mean, that could be reduced to right, like, significantly. Course. Now it's outsourced to a company in India and they call MIT and Stanford through an electronic means that they verify. <laughs> Yeah. But it used to cost hundreds and thousands. All the employees in the human resources department cost a lot of money. Yeah. 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 So Especially in the Bay Area. Yeah. Let's okay. get before Pamela says anything. Or go ahead. Um, <laughs> we, we're pretty much done. We're okay. So let me just uh, do one quick thing here. So I would like everybody to uh, give the uh, a round of applause to our panel here. They were wonderful. <laughs> and also, I'd like uh, everyone to give a round of applause to. A special person who put the whole thing together. That's Pemmel.